Now, the issue of maternal health is a local as well as an international one, which explains why one of the Millennium Development Goals deals directly with maternal health. But we'll be asking the question, what exactly is maternal health? And um, to take me through this interview, I'm joined by Dr. Ann Kihara, who is a, universe, uh, a lecturer at the University of Nairobi and the Vice Chair of COGS. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, Professor Joseph Karanja, who is an associate uh, professor rather, uh, of uh, OBSGYN and a lecturer, I'm supposing, at the University of Nairobi. Thank you so much for joining us both. So, Dr. Kihara, we can begin with you. What exactly is maternal health? A lot of people hear it, uh, but they're not too sure where exactly it falls and why it affects anyone for that matter. Well, I'll start by defining what really health is, because unless you understand what health is, you can't apply it to the mother. Basically, it's the physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just elimination of diseases that may result. Now, how can we go about it? Specifically for the mother, it relates to the reproductive tract, the functions of the reproductive tract, and the processes. So things like childbirth, carrying of pregnancy, after pregnancy, that is what we are looking at, the health of the mother through that whole process. That is uh, what I would actually put it as. Professor Kihara, uh, what are some of the diseases Karanja. or health, um, Professor Karanja, sorry. <laughs> 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 Professor Karanja, what are some of the health issues that are related to maternal health that we see every day in Kenya? Okay, uh, we, we talk of the B5, which are the B5 major causes of direct maternal death. Uh, and those are hemorrhage, hemorrhage that is excess bleeding associated with the pregnancy. Uh, we talk of hypertension in pregnancy. Uh, we talk of infection in pregnancy. And we talk of obstructed labor that you mentioned uh, uh, causes fistula mm -hmm. and also uh, complications of unsafe abortion. Uh, those are the major five direct causes of maternal deaths. Then we have. Uh, indirect causes such as HIV AIDS in pregnancy, uh, malaria in pregnancy, uh, and other conditions like that. Right, now the, the, the big five that you've spoken about yeah. sound to me like they are preventable. Why is it that a lot of women are still dying from these? That is the unfortunate bit. They are completely either preventable or treatable if they occur. So they need not occur. In fact, the, tech, the knowledge and the technology to treat most of them has been there for a hundred years. It is the commitment of our countries that lacks. Mm -hmm. We have to commit ourselves to preventing and treating these conditions at the highest level. From the highest level, that is the political commitment, government commitment, and then community uh, commitment and family commitments because it is a little investment, but the returns are very high. Poor countries have done it, we mm -hmm. can do it. Uh, Dr. Kihara, we're talking about, um, I mean, <coughs> Professor Karanja has mentioned, you know, commitment from all levels. Let's look at the family level. Um, are women concerned about their maternal health, or are these issues occurring because of ignorance? I would believe very strongly every woman who is pregnant is definitely concerned about her well-being and that of the baby. But let's look at it from the social cultural context. Is this woman educated? Do we have the finances to actually get the care that we need? This is a patriarchal society, basically. Right. So the decision making really lies with the man. So is he making decisions that are appropriate? You know, we are talking about a woman attending clinic getting to deliver in a setup where there's skilled attendance, but who is actually providing that finances? Who is the one providing the transport? Who is providing the care? You know, you're talking about a woman who needs nutrition, as an example. If she's anemic, the nutritional requirements change and become a little bit more sensitive to actually helping her and helping her baby. Is that readily available? Mm -hmm. These, that's just one of the examples. Now let's come to the health system itself. Once the woman does get there, you've heard about the delay system in the clip that came before right. pertaining to the fistula. The woman has gotten to the system. Does she get appropriate quality care when she finally gets there? What are the referral mechanisms that are in place to take care of this woman? Finances notwithstanding, because if I have obstructed labor, I'm in a peripheral center, 
how do I get, then get to a tertiary facility to actually get the help required? So I think, as the professor is saying, there should be a combined sense of responsibility. Uh, this combined sense of responsibility, if it is lacking, it does result in deaths. And not True. just of the child, but also of the mother. What are the figures so far regarding um, deaths caused by maternal health? Uh, the figure currently is standing at 484 per 100,000. And this is actually a rise because b uh, the previous figure was 414 yes, per 100,000 in 2003. In the 90s, it had been at around 512 yes. per 100,000. So you can see at one point we seem to be having gains, but now it has seemingly risen up. Right. Okay. Now here we are saying the MDGs are telling us by 2015, our maternal mortality should actually have been reduced by about 75%. So we should be in the 100 per 100,000 figure. We're actually going up. So where are we going wrong? So this is one reason why we need to recourse to readdressing ourselves. Professor Kehera, perhaps you can Karanja. answer. Karanja. Uh, <laughs> Professor Karanja, I'm sorry, I keep it's okay. messing up. <laughs> From now on, I'll just refer to you as Professor. Yes. Um, where, are we, where are we going wrong, as uh, Dr. Kehera has said? She said, you know, um, the MDGs are there, they've set up some goals for us, but we're going in the completely different opposite direction. Uh, we need to, uh, to, to, to <coughs> elevate the, the status of women. Uh, one of the greatest uh, experts in reproductive health has said that uh, these deaths are not being caused by diseases we can't treat or prevent. They are occurring because our societies have not, you know, considered women's lives worth saving. So we have to consider women important enough to want to save them from unnecessary deaths. And the, the government has to put money in the budget that is enough for health. African countries promised 15% of their budget to health in Abuja. It is called Abuja Declaration. We haven't. I think we have committed only half of that mm -hmm. or less than half of that. Then we have to improve the infrastructure, the roads, you know, that transport women with emergencies to hospitals. Uh, we have to improve the facilities themselves and we have to have trained manpower to take care of our women. Doctors and nurses are moving away from this country because we are not committed to remunerating them well. Mm -hmm. uh, and those who remain, they are concentrated in the big towns like Nairobi. If you go to northeastern Kenya, uh, northern Kenya, you know, expanses of the Ukambani district, you find that there may be one or two doctors in a whole big district. He is, they are doing administration as well as clinical work. So they are overworked. So we have to change. We have to commit uh, money. We have to commit resources to health. All right. Um, and just on that note, I mean, I understand that the issue of maternal health is quite broad. And what we're going to touch on today is just, you know, on the surface. But if you have any questions from home, if you have any particular issue concerning maternal health, do send us an SMS to 8040 and we'll be sampling some of your views and your questions while both the professor and the doctor are in studio. And they will be able to deal with these queries directly because I understand that information is key. And we'll go straight into that education. You had touched on that earlier. But if women were equipped with this information, if they knew what to do when... The, uh, you know, they have a pregnancy, matters of contraceptives, matters of vaccines, and it comes to issues like cervical cancer. Would these numbers come down? I believe very strongly. But I think it's two-way. Uh, communication from the health sector to the public. And secondly, health-seeking behavior. Right. I think that is something that we cannot go without emphasizing. Why is it that we're asking women to come to the clinic? I think I'll start it from the spectrum of even before she's pregnant, as she plans for a pregnancy, have we screened her for diseases, things like HIV? Have we screened her for anemia? Because if she's starting a pregnancy and she's already having a very low blood level, and then unfortunately bleeds during the pregnancy, that will only aggravate her condition. Is she coming for the clinic and what are we then doing in the clinic setup? Is her pregnancy growing appropriately? That's the clinician to determine. Still, further screening, the blood group the screening for HIV, the screening for syphilis, the urine examination, the routine things that we would do. But this is also an opportunity to provide health education. Right. As far as nutrition is concerned, as far as prevention of diseases, things like tetanus, how does she protect herself from malaria, 
giving her hematinic so that at least the blood level is appropriate, prevention of mother to child transmission for the woman who's afflicted by HIV, even giving her the education and possible screening for cervical cancer even at that point. So the antenatal clinic actually presents a time where a woman can actually get extra value for her reproductive health. Besides that, decision making, as far as her delivery, she's carrying a pregnancy. You've seen a lot of obstructed labor. Mm -hmm. Some of this we can actually detect or predict may give her a problem at the time of delivery. We can actually then plan for an elective cesarean section as opposed to her going through the labor pains and eventually having the obstructed labor, as an example, mm -hmm. okay? So issues of risk assessment. Every time a woman comes to clinic, you're constantly checking, is she developing a problem, whereas she had been relatively stable. Now, coming to the part of the actual delivery, by the time you're getting to your delivery process, have you made a delivery or birth plan? Where do you want to deliver? If you have a risk factor, definitely, I'll tell you, please, Mwikali, if you're bleeding during your pregnancy, don't come to a peripheral clinic. Come to a higher level clinic, where at least you have the facilities for cesarean section and possible even blood transfusion. Right. So a birth plan. Then emergency preparedness. Woman is expectant. Anything can happen contrary to the norm. Mm -hmm. What is your emergency plan? as you plan for that delivery. These are things that one can actually get sorted out. I don't believe that requires a very high literacy level. As long as you present yourself to the clinic, you'll be guided by the clinicians attending to you. All right, uh, now we're talking about these issues assuming that the people who are coming into these clinics are women and you know they're mature and they know exactly what's happening. Uh, but Professor, a lot of the time we see young girls who are you know, getting into unplanned uh, pregnancies. What happens to them? Um, Dr. Kihara, I see you nodding <laughs> very vigorously there. Yes, yeah. uh, the problem of young people getting pregnant before they are ready is a major one. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the major causes is a lack of, you know, education, sexuality education for young people. Mm -hmm. uh, we teach our young people almost anything else, physics, calculus, and so on, but we don't teach them properly about how their bodies develop, you know, about their anatomy, about the physiology, mm -hmm. and we leave them to find out this information from the wrong sources, and in the process they get pregnant. You know, some of the opposition, you know, comes from certain groups, uh, but it is really not, uh, you know, justified. We need to agree that our young people, and in fact everybody needs education to know how their bodies function, how to avoid pregnancy. And avoiding pregnancy is not just contraceptives. Mm -hmm. You can avoid pregnancy by avoiding sex, for example, or by avoiding sex during the time one is fertile. Mm -hmm. So these are things our children should know, and if they did, they would postpone becoming pregnant until they are ready. Uh, you I, um, sorry to cut you short, you did mention <laughs> um, something on contraceptives, mm -hmm. and you know, there was another feature not so long ago about how they're easily distributed over the counter, anyone can get access to them, particularly, um, you know, emergency, emergency contraception, right. Um, is this a, a, a topic of taboo? Are we not talking about this? Is this why uh, we're continuing with this as frivolous as we are, or, or what, what's, going, what's going on? Um, the, our national guidelines on family planning uh, recommend that, yes, the emergency contraceptive pill can be sold over the counter. But it is upon our people to know that the emergency contraceptive pill is an emergency pill. It's not a, a regular a pill to swallow every other day. Although it is one or two little pills, they are very, very strong. So it is not a pill a woman or a girl should use every other day. It is meant for emergencies such as rape, such as occasions when condoms uh, rupture or people who attend parties, they take a few more drinks than usual and their resistance is reduced and they end up having sex. Those are the situations when emergency pill is supposed to be taken. If you need it more than 
uh, once a week or once in two weeks, then you need a regular pill, right. which is milder and doesn't cause as many problems as an emergency pill taken every other day. So, so you know, there are many other contraceptives, safe, safe for even young girls, than the emergency contraceptive pill. Let's leave emergency for emergency. Right. <laughs> now, Dr. Kihara, we've gone from talking about, um, you know, abstinence to contraception, and then comes the next thing, which is abortions. Mm -hmm. A lot of girls and women as well, we have heard, are still uh, going for abortions because mm -hmm. these things happen, and for one reason or the other, they feel the need to get rid of the pregnancy. Um, first of all, do you know what the figures are, and uh, what is the scenario right now in the country? Dr. Kiara is looking at me. Yeah. She <laughs> said, I take the statistics. Yeah. Well, it is estimated, it was estimated through a large study in this country about uh, eight years ago that uh, over 300,000 abortions occur in the country per year. And out of this... Sorry, this is eight years ago. The eight years ago, mm -hmm. that right. is 200, around 2002, 2003. Mm -hmm. That's when the study was done. Well, things haven't uh, reduced. We, we think they are the same or worse. Oh, yes. 300, over 300,000 out of these 21,000 are admitted to public hospitals because of complications. And out of those admitted, about 1% die. How many cases do you see? I'm sure you get um, walk-ins every now and again. Um, I can talk about just last week when I was covering the acute um, gynae ward, which is principally over 75% of the cases coming in are those coming in with complications of unsafe abortion. Over 70%. Yes. Now, this ranges from bleeding. So you have women who are even kept in the ward because of anemia. It also has sepsis or infection. So you have women who not just have infection of the reproductive tract, but have it even spilling into the abdomen. So end up having surgeries. I have one in mind where I had a 16-year-old I had to actually remove the uterus because she had had the unsafe abortion, the uterus was grossly necrotic, and I was called in to actually assist this lady. This is a very young girl, 16 years of age, has lost the uterus. But the issue is give her at least the quality of life. So unsafe abortions are still going on. All right. Something totally preventable. You're talking about very gruesome details yes. here going on in the 16 year old. How does this happen? Because we don't, we, we, we don't talk about this issue. This, is a, girl, is, this is a girl with an unplanned pregnancy. Probably has a stigma associated with it. Is still probably going to school. Or has been rejected even from the family front as a result of this pregnancy. So what do you resort to? Psychologically, you're not prepared for this pregnancy. You go to the back street, get the abortion procured. And when I say the back street, it could be even a medical personnel, but in a hostile environment it's unclean or it could be actually a quack who procures the abortion and then the sequelae that follows infection sets in the bleeding continues by the time you're now coming to the facilities things have already gone too wayward all right there's already a question regarding that does unsafe abortion impact on maternal mortality what is your society I suppose our society, because it's yeah. ours. What is our society doing to reduce the numbers? It's a question by Lucy. Um, Professor Karanja, do you want to take that? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Well, as we said, mortality due to unsafe abortion is completely preventable. Mm -hmm. First, it is by avoiding sex when you are not ready for it. Second is by avoiding unwanted pregnancy. And we avoid unwanted pregnancy by either taking a contraceptive or avoiding the times that one can get pregnant. And then if a pregnancy occurs when it is not supposed to occur, there are safer ways of terminating the pregnancy than going to the quacks. You know, and our people should know that they, it's, not, it's dangerous to go to the back street. That the, let them come to the professionals and they will be helped. Uh, when you say let them come to the professionals, they will be helped, you need to clarify that because somebody might be assuming, okay, I'll just walk into Dr. Kihara's <laughs> office and tell her that I want an abortion procured and she'll go right ahead and do it. Well, the, the, the Dr. Kihara will assess her. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know that according to our new constitution, a woman is entitled to termination of pregnancy 
if that pregnancy is a threat to her life, is a threat to her health, or is required for emergency treatment. So many of those who go to the quacks fit into one of those uh, classes. Because if a, somebody is stressed enough to go to a quack, they are risking death. And many of them die, as we shall point out, even your media has reported just last week, a young girl of 16 died in Mbita mm -hmm. uh, district because she went to the quacks. It was reported in the standard the, the first day of uh, last week. Right. Um, more questions here. <clears throat> what happens if you don't go for a checkup before and after giving birth? Uh, because they're saying, could it lead to many dangers? And brings in the issue of, you know, uh, midwives especially in the rural areas really well because a lot of them think well a lot of the people who go to see these midwives believe that okay i'll just wait until my due date go to the midwife deliver and go home um i think you're losing up on risk assessment because pregnancy as i said is very labile and it's only through presenting yourself that one can pick out problem or confirm that everything is okay because it's not just problems that we pick out. Mm. So I would advise very strongly. In fact, the recommendation now is women are being asked at least come four times during your pregnancy, which is not too much to ask. Before we used to say come for clinic, I think it was coming to about 13 visits. Yeah. But we're saying, visits. yes, yeah. the initial protocol that we used to have, people would come every month, every month, uh, two every weeks. two weeks, and then every week, which comes to about a total of 13. Now we're saying, we want you to come at least four times during your pregnancy. So it's in those four visits that we are saying we're having what we call comprehensive assessment of the woman. It's actually coined as focused antenatal care. So in those visitations, not only are you looking at the health of the mother, you're looking at the health of the baby, taking this opportunity to prevent ailments and to also manage other things. Uh, another question here. My sister passed on after a C-section. Um, it's so sad that more mothers are dying uh, on the table. Please check maternal death records and save us. Uh, Dr. Professor Karanja, you're the expert on statistics here. Mm -hmm. okay. How many mothers would you say die, perhaps annually, um, from complications in labor? Um, well, we said the total how many die mm -hmm. uh, for 188 per 100,000 deliveries. Uh, but we don't have a breakdown as to how many die because of cesarean section. Well, one can die of, uh, in association with the cesarean section either because of a condition they had before. They went to theater when they were already in complication, such as complications of high blood pressure, or they were bleeding. But I agree with her that, you know, uh, it need not happen if proper precautions are taken, if blood is available, and if she is operated in a a facility that has the necessary support, that has the necessary uh, theater facilities and the necessary support facilities, and with good, uh, well-trained doctors. Uh, the other thing I think I'll probably add is um, we're doing what is called clinical audits. Clinical audits per facility. So within facilities, we're encouraging doctors now to look at maternal mortalities, not as things to go to the place, but basically as a learning experience, you know, learn from what has happened so that you can prevent it even to subsequent, from subsequently occurring, or put in measures that can actually improve the quality of care that's being delivered. Now, we were talking about the cesarean section, yes. and I remember there was an argument that, uh, you know, a lot of women are being misinformed or misadvised on what sort of de delivery they should opt for. Um, what are some of the things you should look out for just before your delivery, whether or not to know if you're going to have a natural birth or a C-section? Okay, you have um, what we call the risk assessment. Has she had a previous cesarean section? Does she have a complication that is also affecting the pregnancy, something like hypertensive disease mm -hmm. or maybe diabetes in pregnancy where you have a very big baby, then what are the maternal pelvic bone structure vis-a-vis -vis the size of the baby? Because that is something that needs to be assessed and usually is done around the 36th week. 
than the circumstances under which she has gotten to be pregnant. We're having a lot more women delaying their fertility and getting pregnant in their later years. We do know there are problems associated with that. We have a lot of women who are now going through fertility treatment regimens, getting multiple pregnancies, maybe two or three. Mm -hmm. So you find even a cesarean section may be called for then. You have the placenta. It can be sitting as a low-lying structure. In other words, at the entrance before the baby. So then again, that will be a lady who probably would end up with a C-section depending on how um, encroached that placenta is towards her passage or her birth canal. Right. So those are some of the things that would actually contribute to cesarean sections. Professor Karanjo, we're talking about uh, pregnancies which would ordinarily be successful, but there are cases where you get you know, ectopic pregnancies and you get miscarriages. Are there complications which come about with these? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. of course, ectopic pregnancy comes in the early uh, pregnancy. And this is a pregnancy that is not situated in the uterus, it is situated in the fallopian tube where it can't grow big as soon as it reaches two months, two three months. months, it ruptures and it causes internal hemorrhage. That has to undergo uh, emergency operation to remove. Uh, adding to uh, the question of caesarean section, I would also urge Kenyans not to ask their doctors to do caesarean sections for no reason at all. Mm -hmm. There are many women these, there are very many women these days who are asking doctors to deliver them by caesarean section without an indication. They have some indications which actually are not justified. They say their bodies will get loose and things like that, which is not <laughs> true. Are doctors allowed to do this though? <laughs> yeah, they, they force them to do that, you know, and they do. Because if they, uh, Dr. Kihara doesn't go, she comes to Professor Karanja yeah. or Dr. somebody else who will do. What people need to realize, a caesarean section is just not like getting onto the table and having surgery done. There's a lot more. You look at the anesthetic agents that you're using. You look at the fact that you're going to bleed slightly more even during the surgery. So one needs to embrace all those issues. And I think this is where the element of counseling on yes. our part yes. really needs to come in and kick in. But I know a lot of women think it's a fad, you know, it's something worthwhile going for. But look at the bigger picture. I think we really need to emphasize all right. I don't want to let go of that issue without putting the, 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 the practitioners to okay. question here. Because you're saying that, you know, if Dr. Kihara doesn't do it, another doctor will. What is the purpose of the Hippocratic Oath if you're putting finances, I'm supposing, in this uh, scenario before health? Mm -hmm. let, let's agree that there are some doctors who will rush to a cesarean section because it is an easy way out. Within an hour, you are out. Your fees will be three times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. While in normal delivery, you'll be awake the whole night monitoring the labor. Mm -hmm. You are called every now and then by the midwife to ask you what she's going to do, what the next step is. So, yes, people should follow their Hippocratic oath and do things for the benefit of the woman rather than for their own benefit. All right, more questions <coughs> here. Um, this one, Dr. Kerr, if you don't mind taking it. <coughs> Excuse me. How do you count your safe days? Thank you. Very <laughs> short, very simple. I'm assuming this has something to do with uh, Professor Karanja's statement that you don't have to be actively, uh, sexually active when you're fertile. A lot of girls don't know. I'm very happy with that question mm. because that already tells you women don't even know their fertile time. Right. So the risk of her even getting pregnant when she doesn't want it is actually going to arise. Put it shortly. Take your cycle. If you're a 30-day woman cycle, subtract 14. How that do they comes even know if you're, let's begin from how to know if you are 30-day, 28-day. Okay. Simple. Calendar your cycle. Keep a record. Keep a record. So you just need to count the first day I started my period this month to the first day of the next month. This is the number of days. Right. So with time, you will actually get to know your own cycle because I can only apply it to you. Mm -hmm. So if we take arbitrarily, 30 days, subtract 14, you get to number day 16, plus or minus 3 either way, those are your fertile days. All right. I okay. hope that question has been answered. The, they were Whatever anonymous. your number of days, subtract 14, plus or minus 3. All right. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the side effects of using emergency contraceptives, Mary of Umoja, uh, Professor Karanja? Yes, as I said, the emergency contraceptive pill is a very strong pill. 
Um, if you are using ordinary pills, you would use uh, about uh, four or four. eight. Four. Yeah. So it is one is equivalent to the one dose is equivalent to the four of the other ones. So the side effects would be effect on the periods. Periods will, might be irregular. You mm -hmm. might skip them. You might get too frequently. There uh, may be a lot of nausea, a lot of vomiting lots of nausea, lots as of a short-term thing. Yes. But yeah. principally, the periods actually change. Yeah. They All become right. irregular. Um, I mean, we've gone straight into the side effects, but we haven't really said what exactly it does, because I think this is one of the reasons why girls keep taking because they don't know what's happening in their bodies. Dr. Kihara, do you want to take us through that? For the emergency contraceptive, what really happens is you've taken the pill during your fertile period, so the egg is already there. So what you're messing up with is actually the environment where the baby will actually implant in the uterus. So you actually get the shedding of the blood prematurely as a result of taking those pills. The pills are taken in two doses with 12 hours apart. So you take the tab tablet today, 12 hours later you take the second tablet. Or you take the ordinary pill, a higher dose, and then repeat after that, after 12 hours the same. So this is what's really happening. Okay, another question. What would you do in a case where the hospital is 20 kilometers away and a quack is the only person operating in that hospital, which is 20 kilometers away? I didn't know there are quacks <laughs> operating in hospitals, <laughs> but um, I would avoid it at all costs. Yeah. But, yes. but I mean, there are women who find themselves in these situations where... Um, perhaps the nearest available medical facility is quite far and when they get there there's not always a hospital let uh, there's not always a medical practitioner let alone um, an OBGYN to mm -hmm. take care of their maternal needs I think what I'll first say is for anyone attending any clinic please it is your right it is your right to actually get to know who are operating there that's the first step. Number two, we have the national data. Who and what facilities are recognized by this country? So it doesn't take long to just browse and actually get to see, is this one of the listed hospitals, if you're looking at a private practice? Thirdly, you're in the community. You have rights, I'm sure, with all this decentralization within the community setup. Ask questions. Go to your district, what do they call the county, county areas, yes. yes, and get them to actually do a veto system or get the Kenya Medical Board to do a veto system on that particular facility. Mm -hmm. So I think the issue of going to see quacks is very wrong. And this is where we're saying, even right from the onset, when a woman is coming to see you in the clinic, birth planning must be one that is in the forefront for you such that you know this lady when her time comes i'm taking her to a given facility which honestly you could have even gone and seen what are the things that are readily available for this woman all right um my next question is i mean we have mentioned obg OBGYN. <laughs> and a lot of the time, women don't even want to admit that they're seeing um, an OBGYN because they think, oh no, everybody will think that I'm ill. Um, but how important are these regular, regular checks, uh, Professor Karanja? Because Dr. Kihara said you're not only checking for mistakes, but you're also checking to see that everything is fine. Mm -hmm. um, okay, you don't, see, you don't have to see gynecologists every month, once a year. Or a checkup is enough. And we need to check your breast, we need to check your general health, uh, blood pressure, we need to examine your tummy, we need to check your uterus, we need to take a pap smear. Mm -hmm. uh, these are things you need to do only once a year or any other time in case you have a problem. So it is easy to see a gynecologist and they should see one or another doctor if in case there are no gynecologists where they live they can see another doctor or a, a trained midwife. Uh, they can see for annual checkups. Um, fine. Um, I'm 38. I had a miscarriage in July last year. I'm not able to conceive. What can I do? I would advise her to get a checkup from a gynecologist. At 38, she, her years are actually on the higher side. Um, the fact that she did miscarry doesn't mean she didn't get pregnant. She was pregnant. But we need to go and find out specifically for her. What is it that may have precipitated that pregnancy loss? And then take it from there. All right. I spent more than 12 hours after, I think, 
at delivery. My newborn is 3.7 kilograms, had breathing problems ignored by nurses. After asking, um, no one came to me. Uh, I'm translating Christian okay. in yes. mm -hmm. I bled a lot, no milk for baby, infant passes away because no checkup by doctor. Nurses don't check on how uh, mothers should handle newborns. Is it safe to be pregnant three months later? There are so many issues. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll empathize with her, but I can already pick certain things. That was a big baby because yes, the normal size of a baby is 2.5 to 3.5. So 3.7 is already a big or sizable baby. Mm -hmm. The duration of her labor was already going too long. And the fact that the baby may have even gotten birth asphyxia, which is actually a problem breathing. with breathing mm -hmm. immediately after delivery. Mm -hmm. I must be emphatic. Um, then she subsequently developed postpartum hemorrhage. That is the bleeding mm -hmm. that came. Usually when you have a big baby, you have a bigger placenta site, so you tend to bleed a little mm -hmm. bit more. Now, quality of care. This is the big issue. Quality of care. I may be in a setup. I have the personnel. But what commitment do those personnel have in terms of dishing out quality of care? She is pregnant now. I would strongly advise her with all those pictures put together, she needs a senior person. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Karanja, I suppose this is for you. How does high blood pressure affect a pregnancy? Because you mentioned the big five. I suppose now they want to know the details. Okay, the high, uh, high blood pressure causes vessels to constrict. You know, the blood vessels, especially the small blood vessels to the vital organs, uh, become narrower and therefore enough, uh, enough blood supply doesn't go to those organs. And those organs include the placenta, which feeds the baby. So the baby becomes uh, smaller, growth retarded, it might even succumb and be lost. Uh, it affects also the brain uh, and you can have, you know, a stroke uh, or, or eclampsia, the status where you get an, uh, a convulsion and then you go into coma. It affects the heart, mm -hmm. it affects the kidneys also and the kidneys can fail. So this is how high blood pressure, you know, affects you know, the pregnancy, and it also affects the same way any other person who has, you know, high blood high pressure, pressure, even men, even women who are not pregnant. All right, uh, so prevention, especially when you're pregnant. Prevention is checkup. Every time a woman goes to the clinic, the, the most, uh, one of the vital things to do is check her blood pressure. And if you notice it is getting high, we put her on bed rest, we may put her on tablets, to prevent it going higher. Uh, then we do that every time she visits. Sometimes we deliver her before her time. You know, her time is a month away, but we deliver her today to save herself and to save the baby because she can go into those complications of the brain, of the kidney, uh, and so on. And the baby can also succumb. So we save the baby when it can survive and save the mother. All right, um, there are lots of questions here, so I'll just try <laughs> to clamp them into one, the ones which are talking about the same thing. Um, Dr. Kahara, if you can take this. What causes bleeding during pregnancy? I had a problem of bleeding, but it stopped now. Uh, I, but now I experience pains. Is it normal? Please help. And then there was an earlier one saying, uh, what causes sharp pains in the womb? I'll divide bleeding into two parts of the pregnancy. There's early pregnancy bleeding and there's late pregnancy bleeding. Early pregnancy, which goes up until about the seventh month, the things that are commonly seen to cause bleeding then are things like ectopic pregnancies, things like miscarriages, uh, things like um, there could be an abnormal fertilization of the egg where you get a special condition called hydatidiform mole. Some women may experience some little bit of spotting or bleeding with associated sharp pain if they do have fibroids in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Then we have the late pregnancy bleeding. This is basically the placenta, which could be low-lying, which can bleed out before even the baby gets to come. So what we call that placenta previa. Or a woman may have sudden detachment of the placenta of the normal location, what we call abruptio placenta. That is more sinister in the sense that abruptio can usually follow trauma mm -hmm. or follow hypertensive disease. Pressure. Yes? Right. So abruptio placenta. <laughs> Then there are other things, if you have infection in the genital tract or if you have cancer even when you're still pregnant, or if you have florid warts, some women get very, very big warty growths 
in the private parts, which can bleed even in the pregnancy. All right, um, but would you advise them to see a doctor regardless? Uh, Definitely. Definitely. Any woman who is pregnant and is bleeding, you must it's get a, checked. A danger signal. In fact, I wouldn't want you to wait for you to bleed out because a lot of women just lay back and say, oh, this little it's spotting. Little. I went to the small room and I passed you in and not noticed that I was spotting. Please don't take any bleeding lightly mm -hmm. in pregnancy. All right. Uh, very many questions coming. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, back to the issue of the C-section. I got a C-section due uh, to CPD. I'm not sure what that okay. means. Yeah, um, we know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> due to CPD the first time. Yeah. And four years later, another due to a bridge. Again, a term I'm not familiar with. Okay. Is it wise to get another professor karanja first of all what is a CB cpd means kifalo pelvic disproportion that's mm -hmm. where when the head of the baby is too big for the mother's pelvis the baby is too big for the woman then the breech is when the mm -hmm. baby is coming down with the feet or the back bottoms Butter, right. yes and now that she has two cesarean sections it will always be cesarean section elective planned before you go into labor so she can get another baby, but by planned cesarean section. All right. Um, thank you for that question. Now we know what CPD and bridge <laughs> is. <laughs> Hi, I gave birth in October last year, and my monthly periods are not back yet. Is it normal? And I'm still breastfeeding. Yeah, exactly. good. Exactly. Usually, most women who are breastfeeding, the return of your menstruation may be delayed. Breastfeeding in itself, as long as your periods haven't like come back, it's actually a family method. planning right. method. Yes. In fact, the rule is, if you're breastfeeding and your periods return, please make sure you're on another family planning method. But as long as you're breastfeeding, some women you will find the periods don't come. Okay. Um, we've been dealing with women, and now I see an issue regarding uh, a boy. My son has irritant boils around his genitals. We have tried different hospitals, but it keeps recurring. Uh, can the professor please advise Steve from Kibera? You said he has what? He has irritant boils. Oh, irritant boils. Mm. Yeah, he should see either a pediatrician or a urologist. A urologist. Uh, urologist are specialists of the urinary tract. All right. Yes. Why is it that so many women nowadays are giving birth to children who have cerebral palsy Caroline from Mombasa. I'm not too sure if this is uh, directly tied to this. I would agree. Um, I'll look at it differently. The aspects of infection. You can get infections that can affect the baby while the baby's still growing in you. What am I looking at? You have what we call touches. The yes. toxoplasmosis, the rubella, the cytomegalovirus, hepatic syphilis, and do HIV. You know, do they now, know, do you, you know what is cerebral palsy? Yeah? If, you, if you can now break down the terms. <laughs> Cerebral palsy is Cerebral. brain damage. Okay, brain damage to the baby. Okay, so the baby either has spastic condition or is a very flaccid kind of baby. So infections can give that problem. Number two, issues related to delivery. In yeah. fact, I'll put them at the top. How was your labor specifically managed? I want to be very emphatic here to the ladies. Every woman who goes into labor, there is a graphic follow-up that is supposed to be done at the institution to see how progress of labor is going. Now, if you bypass 12, 18 hours, 18 hours is too late if it's a first-time mummy. Mm -hmm. If it's a woman who has delivered before, 12 hours and beyond is too late. Some intervention should have been made. So, those issues pertaining to the delivery process and decision making around delivery process can also give us a problem. Then we have to talk about lifestyle. A lot more women are drinking in pregnancy. A and lot smoking. more women are smoking in pregnancy. These are toxins to your baby. So everything can be done soundly, but the insult has actually been put in by the mother. Right. So these are things that we need to sensitize people on that can result in a baby that ends up with cerebral palsy. 
All right. Um, I think we'll take this as one of the final questions. Uh, although I can be generous and give you one more if you send it <laughs> in just now. Um, what causes, we're being turned into pseudo doctors today because this term I have never <laughs> seen. What causes hyperlipidemia? This is Sami okay. from Tongwe. Um, something, something, Sokomjini. I think that, that, that is a Lipi his place. Lipid is fat. Fat. So hyper is high, high fat. And this is things to do with the cholesterol. You have been told diet can, be, can raise the cholesterol. You have been told lack of exercises, over drinking. Mm -hmm. So it is a matter of lifestyle. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think, you know, before we, we, we wind up this interview, it would be nice for, uh, to get closing remarks from both of you. Uh, we've dealt with quite a number of issues, and these issues will keep creeping up and they'll keep coming up. And the issue of MDGs was brought up for a reason. And there's also a reason why um, governments are being asked to put 15% of their budget towards health care. Uh, but like you said, commitment must begin somewhere, and family is the best place to. What would be your advice to people regarding maternal health? I personally feel maternal health is pivotal to development, honestly. If you don't take care of the woman and you don't care, take care of the child, do not expect our society to progress. I strongly feel male engagement really needs to be beefed up in this country. It's not like there's a closed door system. I find a lot of men, I don't know whether it's because of culture, do not know what's really going on for women, even as they're trying to get clinics. Maybe Professor Karanja can answer yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> so I think men need to also take responsibility. I, I agree. Yeah. We need to take responsibility. But we also, as healthcare providers, need to encourage men to yes. come in during consultation. Mm -hmm. Many times we are told the man is in the car, the man is in the reception. Mm -hmm. They should be there so that as we give advice to the women, they can reinforce it at home. Please do this. The doctor said, you do this, do it. When we say you must come this day, the man knows why, and he will provide the support that is needed. So we also need to include men to support their women uh, get health care. Because we know when a woman is unhealthy, the whole the family, whole family is suffers sick. because the, she is the caretaker. Uh, she also is a health care provider at, at family level. And once she is sick, the whole family suffers. Uh, what a good way to wind up that interview. Thank you so much for your time, both of you, and uh, for your free consultation. <laughs> and <laughs> teaching you a little bit. And welcome. teaching me quite yeah. a number of times. I don't know what a CPD is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really sorry for the people whose SMSs I had to uh, close off because there were simply too many. We didn't have enough time. But you know what? Do keep them coming. Send them especially via um, email. That's sunrise at standardmedia.co.ke and I will forward all those emails I assure you and all the SMSs that keep coming uh, to the doctors and I know a lot of you have asked for their contacts so I'll also be forwarding you the details of that so keep them coming. Thank you once again for your contribution. For now though we have a look at international news and we begin in Japan where the 9.0 magnitude quake and massive tsunami that struck Japan ravaged towns along the coastline leaving thousands missing and feared dead. Rescue teams have have so far found around 300 to 400 bodies in one of the coastal cities. Meanwhile, the aftershocks are still being felt even as new hydrogen explosion rocked a nuclear plant. At least six people were killed in the blast, and here are the details so far.